Welcome to the Get in the Fight podcast. My name is Nate Whitson, and I'm the founder of Get in the Fight Ministries and our exclusive online fight club for Christian men. Everything we do here is dedicated to helping Christian men become the men that God meant for them to be. So if you're looking for helpful content and conversations that can help you to grow and become the man that God made you to be, then you're in the right place. But before we get started, please do me a huge favor and be sure to subscribe, click the like button, and then leave us a five-star review. Doing that helps us to reach more men who are looking for content just like this. Also, if you'd like to learn more about our mission and how to get involved or how to join the Fight Club, then head on over to getinthefight.club. That's getinthefight.club and learn more today. But without further ado, it's time to get in the fight. So let's go. Hey guys, welcome to the Get in the Fight podcast. I'm your host, Nate Whitson, and this is a show uh, for Christian men who want to live bigger, better lives. And we are a ministry that is uh, actively engaged in helping men become the kind of men that God meant for them to be. And we say this around here all the time, but we believe that you are here for a purpose, that God has ideas in mind for your life, that you're needed in his mission for his kingdom's sake, for his glory, for the good of other people. And so we want to figure out what that mission is. We want to go full tilt all the way in with Jesus. And so again, if that's you, and if you resonate with that, if you're a guy that's just saying, man, I, I want to live a better life. I want to live all in for Jesus. Where do I go? Where, where do I learn more about this? This is a great place just to get connected and see. And in fact, today you're going to see that we're going to be kicking off a series of podcasts, probably an ongoing series that I'm going to call Fight Club Stories. And so in our Get in the Fight ministry, we have a private app and community that we call our Fight Club. And this is where men from all over the world can join and connect, do devotionals together in the morning. We do, obviously, this podcast is a part of that ministry. We have Strike Force, which is like a life group type setting where men can really connect and engage with other men and lots of different resources and tools. But it's all made up of Christian men who are in the fight, wanting to live better lives. And what I thought would be really cool is if we could share some of these just stories of just everyday people. We're all just everyday people around here. We don't take ourselves all too seriously. And if you knew us, you would think that was appropriate. <laughs> and these are just these are just men that you're going to see are just men, guys that you uh, will relate with. And in fact, Edgar and I were talking before this. There's my phone. That's fun. <laughs> we were talking before this about, you know, like if you've ever been at church and you've heard, you know, baptisms or testimonies from uh, the people in the audience, they're the best services in the world. And there's always somebody's story that you listen to and go, wow, that is so powerful what God has done. And wow, what a story that person has to tell. And we honor God in those stories for what he's done in everyday people's lives. And I think that in this series of Fight Club stories, you'll be encouraged and you'll you'll get to know that you're not alone in this journey. And I think that's just one of the biggest things the devil tries to convince us men of is that you're all alone, that you don't have what it takes, that somebody else has something you don't. And you will find out in listening, hopefully to this podcast and these series, that you're not alone. So if you if you can, if you like the this series, if you like this podcast in particular, just engage with it, you know, send me an email if you'd like. And if you've got questions, I'll certainly look at all those. Nate at getinthefight.com. But you can go to our <laughs> website, getinthefight.club. You can follow me on Instagram, all kinds of information. But just engage with us and, uh, and join us. We would love to uh, connect with you. So today I'm excited to introduce to you a friend of mine named Edgar Cazell. Is it Cazell? Cazell. Cazell, yeah. Cazell. Cazell. It's, yeah. it's a fancy last name, so I struggle with it. <laughs> but my, my friend, Edgar, I tell you he's a friend, and I tell you I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I should have asked him that before, but yeah. all I know good. he doesn't care. Not um, at all. Edgar is a, is a friend of mine. I've known him for, for quite a long time and has been a part of uh, our fight club for many months now. And uh, just excited to have you on, Edgar. Thanks for joining and look forward to chatting with you here today. I appreciate you having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, man. Well, let's just let's just jump into the conversation and and take us back. You know, take us back to childhood. Tell us a little bit about you, uh, your beginnings. Like, where are you from? Tell us a little bit about your background and you know what was life like for you as a kid. Okay, so my mother and father came from Paraguay, South America. My dad was accepted in. You're going to like this. U of M Medical School. 
So he came here to start the American dream, had three boys here. He came from a, a previous marriage, had two girls, but came here. Unfortunately, marriage wasn't for him at the time. Some infidelity. They divorced, extremely, extremely ugly divorce. And uh, so my mom took us to South America, which was the beginning of my nightmare. <laughs> wasn't the Doris was probably the minimal part of it. So went to South America, and that's where things went awry for me in particular, in terms of physical and emotional abuse, pretty mm -hmm. severe. And uh, my mom would always mention it's because I reminded her of my dad too much. And so that's kind of where a lot of my trauma began. And then, you know, my older brother kind of jumped on that. You know, you see the wounded animal type of mentality. So that's kind of where it started. So I lived there for about, what was I, probably about six years, six and a half years lived in South America, been bilingual my whole life. So this is in a nutshell, we can go deeper as the conversation goes. So finally had the opportunity to come back and visit my father over a Christmas. My mom let, finally let us come visit when I was about 10 and a half, 11. Never forget it. Unbeknownst to me, my dad was waking me up every night with night terrors during my visit. And finally one night I told him I can't go back. Didn't ask why. I just said I can't go back. And unbeknownst to me, he asked my brothers if they wanted to, which they were part of who I wanted to leave behind. Mm. And so they ended up staying. So what I thought I was getting away from just followed me mm. to, to Michigan in terms of my brother, <clears throat> my older brother. And then my dad was really big. He was a very successful doctor, owned his own practice. So time was very limited for us from him. And again, he got three boys thrown up on him that, you know, he didn't really know. Mm. Again, not his fault. We were pulled away to South America. Not much he could do. He fought for us. He was also young, extremely good looking guy. So dates were not a problem for him. So when he wasn't working, he was usually out. Mm. And so we pretty much fended for ourselves, which was good and bad in terms of being raised, but also, you know, had a lot of conflicts with my older brother. He got into drugs and that brought in more chaos into our household. And again, with my dad being absent, he didn't really know what was going on. And so it just brought more, more chaos into my life. Um, in searching for some sort of reprieve or some sort of happiness, I tripped into some magazines that my father had laying around the house. And then that sent me into a very ugly and deep worm of pornography. Mm. And with pornography came sexual encounters. I had my first sexual encounter was I when I was in sixth grade. Wow. And from sixth grade on, was pretty promiscuous. I was seventh, eighth grade dating seniors mm. in high school and above and doing all kinds of things. So that was my my drug or my getaway or my peace or my, you know, feel in control or in power or whatever the case may be. Um, was never a great student, just struggled myself along, but did well. One thing I did have was a good work ethic, worked hard my whole life. You kind of seen that. Mm -hmm. yep, <laughs> I'm never one shy to, to work, do whatever I got to do. Then fortunately, my senior year met the absolute perfect woman and changed my life. It took some time. <laughs> it took some time. I brought in a lot of baggage, a lot of baggage, a lot of stuff she had to deal with, a lot of stuff she had to work with. A lot of things that I had a hard time letting go, um, emotional, physically, pornography, almost cost us our marriage a couple times, mm -hmm. but I was very thankful for her love and strength for God mm -hmm. and for me to give me that time to heal. And I think because of that, you know, we're 
married now going on 35 years. Mm. Been together almost 40. Wow. That's amazing. I say we've been through some stuff, yeah. you know, and it's pretty amazing. Have two amazingly beautiful kids that we adopted. <clears throat> God had different plans for us in terms of having a family, wouldn't trade it for the world, the experience yeah. of it. So have two kids and about, again, if I'm going too long, let me know. <laughs> no, you're doing great, man. You're doing great. You it. And then was doing really well and had a very successful semi-independent financial business and was doing really, really well working for somebody as as an independent, but was reliant on him probably, I don't know, 16, 17 years into the business with him, found out he did a Ponzi scheme and blew up a company and a lot of people's lives, including myself and everybody that worked there, sent me into pretty big depression. And then the unfortunate COVID hit, which added on to the ability to try to work my way out of this funk and then uh, so struggled with finances and a job for a while and got into a really really dark place dark, probably darker than when I was young and being physically and emotionally abused and all that and came to points where I didn't want to be on this earth mm -hmm. for a couple years and it was just really hard it was really struggling and not fun to be around with. Yeah. And my wife, one day while I was at work two years ago, sent me a song. And I know you're in worship and worship speaks to me a lot. Music speaks to me a lot. And she sent me a song and I listened to it for literally a half hour straight on repeat, mm. just hit away and bald and just changed my life right there back yeah. to God. And it was just an amazing change. And since then, I've been doing better. Still yeah. struggle, yeah. But and I want to struggle on more positive too, because I know there's more to the story. Yeah. Um, and so let's come back to the. Let me let me take you back real quick. I want to tell tell us more a little bit of, um, you know, young Edgar there when you're with your mom <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. in Paraguay. Like, just for those guys that have also dealt with the emotional abuse and physical abuse uh, you know you can share what you want of that but kind of just give us a picture of what some of that looked like for you you know during that space there well my mom was also single at the time obviously being divorced and so she was kind of looking for her niche in life <clears throat> and so I, I, I never knew what brought it on, which made it harder because I was probably the easiest of all the kids in terms of attitude or rebellion. It would just literally be come in and you're on my nerves, so I'm just going to take a Cub Scout belt to you okay. or take a broomstick to you or lock you in a room for a while or, you know, it was... That was probably the hardest part it was not so much the physical. It was just the out of the blue, mm. absolutely zero understanding. I remember one time vividly, I was really sad that she was out on a date and was long. And I guess the we had a maid at the time, and it sounds like a big deal, but that's how it is in South America. Mm -hmm. Everybody has one. Um and I guess the maid told her that I was just upset and that upset my mom. And she came in my bedroom and just walloped me for it. Mm. Um, so it was just, I, I wish I could say that, I don't know if I wish I could say, but I, I wish there were some sort of triggers that set it off, but there never was. It just, it was, it just happened. Mm. Literally walk into a room or whatever it was and it was usually with items or you know cub scout belts scared the daylights out of me yeah. um and brother was know, the same the brother just brother was, it. yeah brother was extremely physical with me and again just rage issues he mm -hmm. and i guess now that i think about it is if they just had bad days mm -hmm. i you just happened to be the one yeah I was the middle child syndrome, you know, okay. the older was the favorite and the baby was the baby. So mm -hmm. it's like, eh, 
We just got the middle child. We'll deal with that. Yeah. Probably what saved me through South America is I had one aunt that really was kind of my shelter that I would hide away with at a lot. She never knew what was going on. At least I don't think so. But she was my shelter there. Mm. And I was very thankful for her because she probably got me through a lot. Yeah. Just because I could hide away at her house and hang out with her family and yeah. her maid. <laughs> and her maid, yeah. 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 How, how has how is the, how is that trauma like followed you, would you say? Well, fortunately, and I didn't realize this till I came to a church here in Marshall years ago, is unbeknownst to me, I wanted to, the terminology that was used to me was break generational curses. I saw all this ugliness and evil. This was before I was saved and really understood God. But, you know, looking back on life, I really see how God was just, you know, pulling me and pulling me and pulling me say, you know, just do this, do this. And eventually you're going to come to the point where you're at today. Mm -hmm. And so everything that happened to me, I never wanted to pass along, mm -hmm. but it also did affect me, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of building relationships. Again, pornography became a super huge part. Mm -hmm. Sex became a super huge part of my life and how I identified because it's the only time I felt in control or loved. Yep. So I guess that physical and emotional abuse rather than going into alcohol and drugs mm -hmm. was sex mm -hmm. and pornography. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you carry that. What's the word I'm looking for? That... So for guys, it is an emotional, but you carry all of that uh, sexual ideology into a marriage, mm -hmm. which is so unhealthy. Does that make sense? No, oh, for sure. Because when you're having sex just to have sex, it's very different than when you have sex with your wife. Mm -hmm. And you're bringing, and then you watch this pornography that shows you what sex should be like mm -hmm. with your love, your love, with your loved one. And then you try to mimic that into a bedroom that just is not healthy in any way, shape, or form. Yep. And so that caused a lot of grief and tension between us for a long time until I realized, or it took me time to realize exactly what that intimacy was about. Again, it's caused me severe, severe confidence issues, mm. both you know, in terms of mental, emotional, I have dysmorphia because of it. So I'm just very self-conscious, very insecure of myself, very always questioning what I do, how I do it. Am I a good person? Do people like me? So it's very, it's very, it's been very emotional, probably more than anything. No doubt. In regards to that. So, and I can see that it pushes people away from me because I'm so insecure. So mm -hmm. I have a very small group of friends. Well, at least I think they are, <laughs> yeah, sure. but it's, it's, it's very hard on them. I know it is because I'm just, I'm extremely insecure. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably the biggest yeah. effects it had on me. Yeah, man. Tell, tell us, I mean, I, your, your openness <clears throat> is incredible to share really painful things. And, and I know it will minister to guys listening to this right now. Let's talk about the You'd mentioned it before too. This like pornography almost ruined your marriage a couple times, and you've kind of mentioned some of these things. Like, how have you, how have you worked through it, and what did it, what did it take for you to get to that point to deal with it and protect your marriage? Maybe. Well, I had I justified pornography with well, at least I'm not cheating on my wife. Mm which is, it took me a while to realize that's an absolute lie. Yes. Absolute. Yeah. I'm not physically touching him, but what is, what is the relationship to a woman? Mm -hmm. It's the emotional part. So I was stripping her of that mm -hmm. and it took me a while to understand. So that's how I justified continuing watching pornography yeah. was, well, I'm not cheating on her. I'm not hurting her. Mm -hmm. It's no big deal. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I justified it for a while. And I guess the biggest scare was she literally had 
bags packed. Oh, wow. To leave. Okay. Was it because and of I that was, in particular? And she had confronted yes. you? Is that, is that how yeah, it happened? Yeah, she caught me. Okay. Yeah, she caught me. Okay. It, I was caught a couple times. Okay. I was caught a couple times watching it or having it. And, you know, and then I had to come to the realization of, okay, I do need help. I had to swallow the man's pride and say, no, this is an absolute problem. Mm -hmm. And so we started going to counseling. And even in counseling in the beginning, I was trying to justify and protect mm -hmm. myself and uh, defend myself for what I was doing. No, it's her fault because she doesn't want to do this, or it's her fault because she doesn't want it as mm -hmm. often as I do, or it's this, or, you know, all those things to, to deflect who really needed the work. Mm -hmm. Because in all honesty, and, and I just talked to my wife about this, mm, I don't know, two, three weeks ago, that our sex life is greater than it's ever been. Mm. And it's nothing what I thought it should be. Mm. It Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, awesome. it's, it's when I just allowed it to be what it is, mm -hmm. whatever that was. Mm -hmm. And we've enjoyed it more and more often. And it's just much better because I've just, I've repented. Yeah which was another huge step I had to take. I really had to apologize and I did it again, mm -hmm. you know, just a few weeks ago where I'm just like, honey. And that's when I fessed up to the point to her where I just, I told her, honey, I really finally realized that I was cheating on you. Mm -hmm. And that was very emotional to her for her to re mm -hmm. to hear that from me. And so, yeah. you know, it takes a lot for a man to admit mistakes, mm -hmm. <laughs> even though we know they are. Mm -hmm. And it's so meaningful to the, you know, the most precious gift you've been given is your wife and your kids yep. to say, hey, I'm going to fix me for you, yep. you know, and yep. for me. Yeah. But you're that important. So that lie of it's not hurting her and it's <laughs> not about her and it's not real sex and all, all these things that men say is definitely just a lie. In fact, we know that the Lord says, if you just look at a woman lustfully, mm -hmm. it's, it's adultery. Because yep. had you had the opportunity in person, you would be sleeping with her. That's what you're saying. It's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so we know that the Lord doesn't buy into that lie. He certainly says that even just to look lustfully is the same as, because that's where your heart is. And, mm -hmm. you know, it makes me think that a few things when children in particular are exposed to trauma and when children in adolescence are exposed to pornography in both situations, it rewires their brain and their mm -hmm. connections to trauma and to those images. It, it restructures physiologically how they operate and what they're drawn to. And it's very difficult. I know you know this, but just for the listeners here too, a part of what I am studying to be and getting certified in is to be a sexual addiction recovery professional. And in that, there's in, in a lot of the studies and conversations that I'm having and going through here, one of the things you're learning is just how your brain gets hijacked. And it's really, really hard to rewire it. And yet you read the scriptures and what you find out is that you have to renew your mind. So the Bible doesn't mm -hmm. give you the science, but it gives you the principle. And the idea is mm -hmm. always that you, you have to renew your mind and it takes repentance. It takes mm -hmm. healing from the Lord himself in ways that only he can. I mean, when you, to just listen to your story, there's so much healing that he still continues to do in your life that only he can do. And only you can get in a trusted accountability place with other men but then also to, for God to give you the gift of your wife. What a beautiful gift to bring the healing that you might've thought as a kid, you would never find, right? Like how mm -hmm. powerful to find somebody like that in your life. Yeah. Very, very powerful. You know, cause it, you, you could have found somebody that spurred that continuous, that's right. You know, life, life and lifestyle yeah. and what that would bring you to. So yeah, it was so important. It's an addiction. Yeah. It's an addiction like any other addiction. You can, you can get caught up in it and it does, it rewires your brain, it rewires your thought, it rewires, you know, or there was times which is just absurd to me that I would rather not have sex just to have the ability to watch pornography and be pumped for that. Yep. 
Yeah, very normal. Which is just very normal for that addiction. It takes away the real life. Yeah, Yeah. it does because oh, I'm not getting it that way, and that's the way it should be, or that's how it should feel, or that's yeah. And it, it it was just so such a lie and such an incredible lie. And you know, as I'm furthering myself, and again. Every once in a while, I think, oh, can I, should I? Mm-hmm. And thankfully, I become stronger and stronger. You you mentioned to me a couple of days ago, do you do, I don't know, some certain steps? Mm-hmm. I can't remember what you Brace. called it. Brace. Yeah. And as I was reading it, I'm like, hmm, I never knew that's what it was called, but that's exactly what I've been doing to myself yep. without even realizing. I kind of walk through steps when I start to get to that point. I'm like, okay. I'm a husband first. I have a daughter. I have, you know, kids. I have a responsibility. I have an, a commitment, you know, to honor my wife, to honor God, to do yeah. all these things the right way. Yeah. And, you know, the only way you can help people or be honest with people is if you're really, truly fixing yourself on a daily basis. And yeah. That's all I'm trying to do. No, man, it's amazing. Yeah, like God's just giving you grace in the midst <laughs> of trauma. And like you said, like you just, he's been pointing along your whole life to draw him to you. And he's, he's faithful, you know? And I think yeah. the thing I, you know, I know that in your sharing this, your hope and heart is to hope that men will hear this and find hope. And I hope that's what they hear that in God, he can renew what the devil has tried to destroy and take away from you. And Edgar's story, for those of you listening is just a powerful example of that. The devil wants to steal, kill and destroy you. And he will use any means possible. And he wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to steal and kill from your sex life. He wants to destroy any kind of witness you have. Men that do uh, are caught up in pornography are feel like such frauds that they don't lead their families well. So they don't talk about the scriptures. We know in in studies that they don't talk about faith at home because they feel so guilty and shameful from that. But what we know, and I guess what I would point you to is if for those listening, number one, there is help. You can look in the coaching site of our program here and and find out more to get help. But when you actually repent to Edgar's point and turn to God, he can restore the years that have been ruined and wasted away. And what you find is that in recovery, you actually in real life have better connection than you ever have. You actually have better facts. You mentioned it than you ever could have had when you bought it. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it looks nothing like you see. That's right. That's, that, 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 that's the most interesting thing to me. Mm-hmm. It's nothing what I thought it should be through through the videos. It was nothing. Yep. It was it's just it's it's just the connection is just so different and so much more rewarding and so more pleasing because there's no expectation other than being together. Yeah. And you know, that's that's the most important part of it. Yeah, they, and, they actually call pornography an intimacy disorder. And so everything mm-hmm. you're describing is so exactly right on that what you are missing is a genuine connection. And when you mm-hmm. get rid of the addiction, you actually receive back the thing that you thought you would get, which is true connection. You know, and especially again to hear your story and to think the trauma that comes from being a little boy with nowhere safe to go, nobody is safe, <laughs> right? Nothing feels safe. Right. And then those connections then of course you're going to chase after those other things. Anything that can feel good, you're going to Mm -hmm. instantly as a young man say, I I just, I just want to feel good at all costs. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the devil just kind of ropes you in. Powerful story, Edgar. Thank you for sharing some of that there. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the show so far. And if you are, please do me a big favor and simply get engaged in a simple way for you. That might be, clicking the like button, or maybe subscribing to the show. For others, it may be commenting on a show that really stands out to them, or maybe it's just copying the URL and texting it to a friend, or pasting that into your social media, or sharing it via text, whatever it is. All of those things make a huge difference for us, and it helps us to reach more Christian men who are trying to live bigger and better lives. So number one, thank you for being a listener, and thank you for being a part of this community and part of this show. We appreciate it more than you know, and we appreciate you getting engaged and helping us out. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Let's go back for a minute now to the post-COVID or during COVID darkness, and I know that there was a, a vision that God gave you you felt like 
that you had told me once. No, oh, yeah, um, yeah. Do you are you familiar? So this, you remember? Yeah, no, I remember. This is going to be tough. <laughs> okay. So and, and because so my wife and I, you know, again got married and looking to settle down, and we came to Marshall, Michigan, and fell in love with this place, and fell in love with the church. And we went to this church for a couple decades, for a long time, really involved, really deep in it, really spearheaded into it, involved in uh, mission trips and security and music ministry and children's church and just really head over heels in, in, in love with the church. And so, and, and this will all make sense as I get to the final story <laughs> that the vision that you're talking about so when i lost my job originally that was very painful i it was one of the biggest betrayals i felt my wife actually said she goes honey you've been betrayed that's a deep wound and i'm like oh that that let me put a connection to what i was feeling mm -hmm. so as a guy it felt a little better that i wasn't just a big bag of mess for no reason that i was just that was it. So then when that, after that happened, there was a big, long battle with the ex owner for financial purposes. And we got through that. And so I said, okay, I'm going to start my own business. And then COVID decided to rear its ugly head. I'm going to leave that one alone there anyways. So then I started to delve into again, whatever I had to do, I don't like to receive free gifts. So I'm like, okay, what do they consider a, what's the word that they used a essential worker mm, yep so immediately i found security and i'm like okay i can do security i saw that there's positions in security where i can be all alone don't have to have the shot don't have to have a mask i don't have to be around people which i wasn't concerned out but just to make everybody happy so i could sit in a car and watch consumer trucks or whatever the case may be so i did that but in order to su support my family i had to work in ungodly amount of hours in order to do that. So I was working a lot and I was just getting frustrated and more tired and more angry. And then, you know, the loss of the job and my income and my livelihood that I thought I was going to be there forever started to creep in. And then, you know, the pornography started to creep back into me because that was the set, the stuff that gave me that uh, dopamine rush mm -hmm. and that control issue. And then again, I was sitting in a car all alone and you got these stupid phones that can get you to anything you want to be into and all these different things. And so it just started to spiral mm -hmm. and the devil was like, I'm in, mm -hmm. I've got a hook in and I'm going for two hooks. And he, by the time he was done, he had about 35 hooks in me. And I was just angry all the time. I was resentful. I was bitter. My rights to and from work were cursing God out in every way, shape, or form, swearing at him, making up words to him, blaming him for everything. It was just, it was dark. And there were times where I just wanted to be done. I mean, I know people say that, but there was a couple times that I had the gun in my hand. That's how dark it got. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> fortunately, I had kids at the time and my wife. And so I powered through that somehow, some way. Obviously, it was God, even though I was, I couldn't have been any further. I mean, I was at the point of ready to denounce him, mm -hmm. which is like the biggest sin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it was literally right about that point where I was done, where Alyssa texted me a song. And it, I thought it was a new song by how powerful the words were, but it was an old song by, and it's even a group I'm not a huge fan of, new, Newsboys, I think it was. I sent it to you one time. I think it was Newsboys, yeah. Yeah, I think it was Newsboys. And oh my gosh, every single word of that song was everything mm. you know it was like did they write this for me mm -hmm. and so i just kept listening to it listening to it. sorry no you're great i'm so, sometimes a sissy so i kept listening to it and listening to it and it just started you know going real deep 
And I just, it was literally that day. I'm like, okay, I'm in God. Let's go. Mm. It's, it's you and me now. We'll figure it out. And uh, so then I slowly started, you know, my wife watched it, started getting back into the book and to kind of go back to the church that we left, there was some decisions that I'm not saying we right, they're wrong, they're wrong, I'm right. There were just, there was a conflict of interest that we were having. And that was super hard to leave that church. And then we found the church we go to now. And Alyssa was going, and the kids were going that to a lot longer than I was. And so I started to go back to church and feel the connection and the, the, the spiritual connection that I needed again and started getting into the Bible again and reading with the kids. And like I told you on one of our, our posts that for the past probably year, year and a half, I've sent scripture to my kids every day because I knew how important it wasn't only for them, to be honest, no, you, yeah. it was for me as well, Absolutely. because I had to go through the Bible to find the scripture that would work Right. that I felt. So I was thinking it was for them, and it was, but it was just as much for me. So every morning I would get up, I would listen, I would read, and I'm like, okay, this is the scripture I'm going to send to my kids, and they really enjoy it. And now it's expanded to a couple of my nieces and stuff. But me and my wife were communicating a lot, and I was just confessing a lot of my emotions, and I was, again, being very apologetic to who I was they were very graceful and for, with me for, for a long time because I was just angry. I would go down in the basement, sling things around and punch things and slam things and throw things and curse. For I was just uncomfortable to be around. And so I was confessing a lot of things to her and apologizing to her. And we were coming back from actually a murder mystery. And all of a sudden it hit me. And I said, I, I, I just envisioned what was going on in my life is so I was on one side of a railroad track and there was a railroad track. And then there was this Greek, what I thought was a greener pasture on the other side of this railroad track. And I was trying my darndest to get to that railroad track. And God was physically, I could see his arms around me, holding me. And that was the battle I was having with him mm -hmm. for years. And I wanted there and I wanted there. I'm like, what the heck? Why are you not letting me go? That's where I need to be. That's where, I, not where I need to be. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. And he's holding at me. We're like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? This, And that's where my anger started to compound to him. And I'm like, you're not for me right now, God. I know what I need you're holding me back. and you're not letting me go. Yeah. And then at that split second, when I almost got away, a train comes flying through at Mach 9. I mean, just let me go one second earlier. I let go one second earlier. I was whatever what I was. I still don't know what's on that other side. And I'm thankful I don't know what's on that other side because that train just blew right by me. And it was, you know, it was what I wanted was the church that we left back. It's never come back. I wanted the financial stability that I wanted back, which was never going to come back. You know, there was just a lot mm -hmm. of things that God said, it's time to move on. Mm -hmm. It's time to go forward. There's things that have changed. There's things that I want for you. There's, there's things that you need. And so I'm slowly following that path and that journey now again mm. and kind of reestablishing myself in terms of my Christian life, my personal life, mm. my financial life, um, you know, my friends and different things like that. So it's kind of rough to start all over again. But it's kind of rewarding. Yeah. You know, even at the current job I'm at right now, I'm struggling with certain things about it, but I realized why God did it because he got me this job just in time that my wife went through some pretty serious medical issues. I 
it, you know, at the time I'm struggling through this job going, God, I thought this was the answer. And then this happened. I'm like, oh, God, it was the answer. Maybe for just this season, right. but it was the answer. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, God, I'm just going to go. Yeah. You lead me, I'll go. So Might not make sense to me, yeah. but I'll see it eventually. Dude, it's such, and so such those are kind of the vision, things. Man. It's such a powerful vision, so, I think, of, for a lot of guys listening probably who are going, why is this thing, why are you holding me back? I thought you were... Mm -hmm. Like all of the ways that the devil takes those messaging of like, you know, I need to take care of my family financially. You know, I can't handle this situation. Like, you know, all these things, you must not be good. And then you saw mm -hmm. that God wasn't holding you back. He was protecting you from the train. Powerful. That's just such a He was powerful. preventing, he was preventing death, yeah, really. Right. I mean, if I got hit that, if I crossed that line. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been. It would have been de maybe not physical death to me, right? but I probably would have lost my marriage. I would have lost mm -hmm. my kids. I would have, who knows what deep hole yep. I would have gotten into. Physical and he death was would have just, been a lot better than losing. It would have been a ton those, better, right? Like a ton better. Yes. And it was just like, it was the most real. I realized that God is always mm -hmm. for you, always even when it doesn't feel like it, right. he's always for you. Like I said, for six months, I'm six months to, no, yeah, six, about a year, I'm struggling through this job and I'm like, okay, God, why is this? I'm being, you know, battered. I, I won't woe is me, but it just wasn't the fit. I was praying, God. I thought, okay, God, you finally put me in the perfect job that I'm going to retire from. It's going to be totally gravy. And it wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was difficult. It's hard. And it's not hard in terms of a job, but it's hard, the connection and, and the people that I deal with. And it's just, it was very draining to me. I'm like, God, what, am, you know, I thought this was the answer. I thought this was the answer. And then about a year into it, my wife's health started going a little haywire on us. And I'm like, oh, I've got the insurance that I haven't had in umpteen years mm -hmm. to protect my wife. And then my daughter had some health issues that popped up when she was on mission trips. Oh, that's what this was. This was coming, God, no matter what. Mm -hmm. They were going to live their lives and things were going to happen. You just set dad up to make sure that they were protected. Amazing. And I was like, you know, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, God, for, yeah. for seeing something I didn't see and knowing I could handle this. Right. Yeah. So huge. Again, like it just makes me ask you then, <clears throat> like, um, do you see trial and struggle and pain in a different way now than you used I'm to? I'm glad you asked that because <laughs> I was listening to one of my daily little words and I realized that every single person in this world has struggles. All of us do. Every single one of us do. The only difference, and I use this kind of loosely, between you and me is we have something we can believe in and that's God. Yep. And I could not imagine not having that belief right. and go through the things we've gone through. It's the only difference between the people. I hate to say this and I hope this doesn't sound bad, but between the people that make it and don't make it, mm -hmm. you have to have that faith and that belief that there's something out there bigger than you that's looking over, looking over for you. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, even I told Alyssa, I just got a bonus check, which I'm very thankful for. But normally I would look at it as a negative because it's not adding to my potential retirement, which I know at this point I just will not happen. <laughs> but it came just in the perfect time because I got my winter taxes paid. Mm. And so instead of looking at the woe is me side, remember I talked to you, I don't look at the why anymore. I look at the what. Mm -hmm. So what has God just blessed me with rather than why didn't he bless me with more with the extra? Yeah. Yep. No, he didn't bless me with the extra. He blessed me with, Hey, you got a bill coming up. Guess what? I just took care of for you. Yeah. So now I look at it as, ah, thanks God. Yeah. Appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. That's so great. So yeah, That's I so definitely great. look at it much differently. What, 
so you, and you had mentioned that, you know, like, I can't imagine doing this without God. Tell us, like, how, how did you get to faith in Christ? Where did that, where did that come from? I know you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier. You meet Alyssa. She had a faith in God. Where, where does, mm-hmm. where's, what's the jump off? Like, how do you get to Jesus? So I was, <laughs> this might sound bad, but I was raised in a Catholic obviously being Hispanic, Alpha you're America. Catholic. That's just <laughs> yeah, you're just what you are. You have no choice. Right. But as I was going to church with my mom and then with my father, I just saw, saw it very, and again, nothing against the Catholic church. This is just me and my interpretation of relationship with God. I just felt unconnected. I didn't understand why there weren't Bibles in the church. I didn't understand why I had to go to a preacher, a pastor, or confessional to talk to God. I didn't, you know, there were a lot of things that, why can't I talk to this man? Why can't I talk to this person? Why can't I have a, why do I have to go through you? That never, and again, I was 11, 12 years old. What do I know? But something just didn't ever feel right. And so In the journey of me protecting my physical and emotional self, I was always trying to find ways to avoid home. Mm -hmm. And so during sports seasons was easy. I'd stay after practice. I'd do my thing. Then I'd go to work because I worked also as a young kid. Back then you could work at age 12, 13. Then I'd go to bed, get up, scat out of there, go to work. But my season was coming to an end and I'm like, oh, I got to start going home. That's four more hours. I got to be alone Mm. with my brother. What do I do? Mm. So I tripped over a sign called FCA. Have you ever heard of Mm -hmm. it? Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Had no idea what that meant because, you know, Catholicism never used the word, at least back then, of Christianity. So I didn't even know. I knew what it meant. I wasn't dumb, but I was like, okay. But the person that was leading it was a teacher that I loved. And I'm like, okay, perfect. I'll just go there. It covers the hours. Right. That was it. <laughs> yep. Then I walked to this classroom and I saw like three or four of my friends and I'm like, oh, okay, this, this won't be bad. Literally, it was only to kill time. Started getting involved in fellowship to Christian athletes and all of a sudden tweaks started happening in my heart mm-hmm. and how they talked about relationship. You know, that's when I started first hearing about personal relationship with God. And I'm like, what's that? Then they started praying. I'm like, oh, this is really weird. And it wasn't the scripted prayer that you Mm -hmm. read in a Catholic church. It was an actual, your prayer, which was super foreign to me. Like this stuff is kind of weird, but I like it. (laughs) And then one of my not girlfriend, but a friend of mine that was a girl invited me to one of her churches and it was a non-denominational church. And as we walked in, it was at a school at the time. And as we walked in, I heard the music and I was blown. That's probably where my love for music came in terms of feeling God. Because that was the first thing I heard as I started walking into the church was the the contemporary Christian music. And I'm like, whoa, this is super cool. Yeah. This is what I thought church should be like. And then we started getting into the message and I'm like, personal relationship, be with God, pray with God. He's with you. He's for you. And all these different things that started to just all of a sudden, like, yes, this is what I thought, what it was. Mm -hmm. Then speed up a little bit. Another friend of mine in that same group invited me to a camp in Indiana Never forget it. And that's this is where I got saved. I met a counselor. I wish I remembered his name. I can picture him. Beautiful man. He was the one that brought me to Jesus. But we were the the, the really the only time of that entire camp, which was a week, that I can remember is A, almost dying getting there because we were in a friend's car that I at this time remember or now know that carbon monoxide from the engine was coming through the roof of the door and we were all falling asleep as we were driving there and probably slowly dying. Fortunately, it was the summer, so the windows were down. But I was at a church service and we were, he was doing his preaching. And at the end was my first hear of an altar call of, you know, 
if you want to accept Jesus Christ into your life. This is the first time I ever knew what that was, didn't even understand it. And he started asking people and I'm like, oh, wow. And so I never even got to that point, but everything just froze. Everything stopped. I know this is going to sound really weird, but everything just stopped. Everybody just slow motion. And I literally came out of myself and just hovered over myself. And I saw myself bawling there and this guy coming up to me. And then the next thing I know, we're walking out of the church and he's walking me to our, our cabin. We sit down and then we, I, that's the time I accepted Jesus into my life. How old are you? And I was 16, 17, 16, 17, okay. 17. Yeah, 16, 17. I think it was a sophomore, junior, somewhere in that realm. And so that's when I first got, you know, accepted Christ into my life. Now, again, did I go the full board on the super Christian? Heck no. <laughs> I was still knee deep in all my sin. You know, yeah. that was a hard leg to break. But it was enough where I started to tweak things in my life, you know, started to make some changes. And I was going to take a lot to get fixed. And it was obvious. <laughs> and it did take me probably longer than I wanted to. But that's when my journey started. Yeah, that's an awesome story. You know, story, that was man. when my journey started. And, and, you know, it was, I was, you know, thankful for that camp. You know, again, God put it like a spirit in me that, I knew stuff that I shouldn't have known because I knew nothing better. Yeah. But so it's just been good. It's been, it's been a journey and it's been a trial and it's been tough. You know, people say once you become saved, everything's roses. Yeah. That's no. not true. <laughs> that's not no. true. <laughs> no. Well, no. We just have a few more minutes here together, but I just, I, I want to ask you now then, like, <laughs> what are, you've been through some, wow, like hard, hard things and God has really been so faithful and good to you. And that's been like, you, you tell the story so well, what are you, what are you most proud of right now? Like what, what do you look at right now that makes you have the most joy and makes you the most proud? I pr probably, like I said, breaking those generational curses, yeah. you know, that that's what makes me proud. I bringing the church and the Bible into my family's life way sooner than it was introduced to my life. And again, I haven't done it perfectly. Could I have done more? Absolutely. Sure, sure. But I don't want to live in regret. I want to know that I hopefully put enough in them that they'll one up me yeah. in that area. Yeah. I would love for them to one up me. You know, I had the ch kids into church early, my daughters into, you know, the, 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 music ministry at her youth group. My son goes to youth group all the time. They read the Bible. They get my messages. Now that my seasons are over, we're sitting down and talking about the Bible. So, you know, probably that's my biggest takeaway or my biggest pride. And the fact that me and my wife were able to work through our stuff yeah, together. That's awesome, man. You know, it's so easy to walk away. Mm -hmm. So easy to walk away. So much easier. Yeah. And I'm just so thankful that we've learned to, <laughs> a pastor friend of ours called it, have intense fellowship <laughs> and then be okay. Because you're going to. Marriage is not easy in yeah. any way, shape, or form. <laughs> but we're in it together. And so I'm thankful for that. Dude. You know, my dad was divorced five, four times. My mom was divorced three times. That's the easy route. Mm. You know, work through it. Become stronger together. Be better. Let your kids see it. Let you guys know that you guys fight and then love each other two seconds later. <laughs> Not going anywhere. You know, let her, let them know it's hard. Yeah. You know, but you can get through it. So, you know, those are probably the biggest. I still got a lot to work on myself, but you know, I'm I'm thankful that I've stopped the physical, the emotional, the mental abuse, the the. You know, as, as I try to say, the cheating on, you know, the extramarital affairs, which, you know, I hate to think about it, but pornography kind of is. Sure. I shouldn't say kind of, it is. But, you know, I dialed it back, but now that's out of my life. Yeah. And, you know, teaching my kids that that's wrong and different things. So that's probably my biggest takeaway. It's huge, brother. It's huge. And, and 
for any man out there. Like we all feel like when we're telling our stories, like oh, I have so far to go and that's true. And yet God, <laughs> and yet God, yeah, right. It's like, yes, yeah. yes, there's more, but God has done such a good work in you. You're an amazing husband, amazing father. You've broken chains that, that, that is like, you ought to be proud of it. You know, yes, it's God mm -hmm. in you, but you've had to humble yourself. You know, the devil tried mm -hmm. to destroy you. He tried to steal everything from you. You repented, you turned, you came back and God has restored and renewed. And there's so much to be proud of in the Lord, you know, for what you've done there and for all that God wants to do in the future. Tell me really quickly, I know this means a lot to you as well, but what does it mean? You know, obviously you're a part of the fight club here in our ministry, we get in the fight and you've done lots of different things in men's ministries over the years. Really quickly, maybe tell the guys listening to this, your take on why it's important to walk with other men. And I've explained to you, I, like you said, I've been in a lot of different men's ministries trying to become a better man. I, I think the one thing that I, I love the most about this group, and I've told you, is the pure honesty that all the men have had in this group. We've always talked about, you know, pornography and, you know, alcohol abuse and drug abuse and all those different things. But it's always felt a little superficial where everybody talked about it, but neither really admitted to it, even though we all knew somebody had to have been doing one of those things. It's just the odds are against us that all of us are super perfect. Right. And I never felt that every, anybody was very comfortable with admitting their mm -hmm. sins. And not to call anybody out, but somebody exposed themselves in a way that was like very freeing, I think, to everybody in the group to like, okay, this is not just the walk. Mm -hmm. This is the actual talk. And I noticed I, at the beginning, I noticed it was closed. But after that confession, I saw just a more liberation of the men in the group to be more open and honest. So I think that's the biggest thing. If you find a group, if nobody's willing to admit their mistakes, it's not the group for you. You've got to know that you're not a crazy person other men that are struggling and men that you think are perfect <laughs> aren't really that perfect. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Yeah, no, it's true. They have things they're working through and we all want to help each other. But unless we can say, I'm also one of those people right. or was one of those people, let's work through this. We can get it. It's so the, the honesty yeah, of man. the group. It just makes me think like the reason we're doing these fight club <laughs> stories is for that very reason. You know, it's very mm -hmm. easy to see Christian men at church or on Facebook or in a, even a fight club like ours and just go, oh, well, Edgar is always posting these super positive things. He must just always be happy. He must have just had a great life growing up, probably had an easy <laughs> right. or whatever. Like you, you could make up all of these right. things of like, oh, because he is a positive person, everything must be good for him. Right. And then you hear your story and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute we're all, we all have stories. We all have stories. Yeah. And yeah, that's just my encouragement to men listening to is find a place where it can be authentic and you can still be fully loved because that's the way it is mm -hmm. with God. That's the beauty of it. That's mm -hmm. the healing that comes is when you're fully known and still fully loved. And that's the beauty of a marriage that has like yours gotten to the place where now it's fully known. There's no secrets. And no. now it can be fully known and you didn't walk away. She didn't walk away. Now you've got intimacy. Mm -hmm. Now you've got connection. And, mm -hmm. and that is what God is offering to men is let it out there. Don't, don't stay in the dark. Don't keep it to yourself because the devil will lead you to either spiritual or physical death. He will steal everything from you. And so find a place, find a community. It doesn't have to be this one. You're, you're welcome to check out getinthefight.club. We would love to have more men that want to be fighting like this. But yeah, if it's not this one, find it, make it happen in your church, uh, but get connected and share your stories. Um, all right. One more, Edgar. How about that? All right. This has been yeah, so good, yeah, man. Yeah. So, so grateful for this conversation. Thank you so much. If there's just, we'll just do it this way. If there's any one message or one piece of advice you would like to share, 
what would you what would you tell a man today or what piece of advice or encouragement beyond maybe some of the things you've already said is there anything that stands out to you today you think you know what this is what i want to say this is where i think men should go don't give up on yourself yeah, that's good it's yeah a... i mean yeah you mentioned that a couple of times like that's the easy route out when we do when we cheat when we take the devil's road instead of the lord's but you're right like don't give up you know don't give up on yeah. yourself you're worth yeah, it man you're worth it you're worth it to yourself and you're worth it to your family that's awesome just don't give up on yourself figure it out yep, that's right that's... <laughs> and you need that community to help you figure you it do. out you, you need those people to help you figure that's it out right so like it you know really quickly too i would have never felt comfortable to speak like i am now until i found this group mm -hmm. So it's just let me feel more comfortable of just being open and honest. So it's awesome, man. Well, listen, Edgar, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for being in this community with these men, but also this more public community for people to listen to now as they've, if they, you know, are listening to the story as you're, they're sharing your heart, sharing your struggle. What I had said at the beginning, I think is so true. Anytime you get to listen to a testimony of God's goodness, his unfailing love, his faithfulness in a man's life, it is so encouraging. And I know you've encouraged so many people. I can't wait to hear the feedback that comes from it. I know, <laughs> I know men are going, going to be more open with their struggle, their story, uh, because you've shared yours. So thank you for joining and being on here today. Oh, thanks for having yeah, me. Man. Appreciate yeah, you. brother. So listen, guys, as we wrap up here today, this is just a call for you uh, to live a bigger, better life. You've got to humble yourself. You've got to repent. You've got to turn back to the Lord, not give up on yourself uh, to understand God's word and God's will. Uh, you need to do that within the context of other believers. And so if you're not connected again, check it out at getinthefight.club. Uh, start, a, you know, ask somebody at your church, find a mentor, find a brother, find people, whatever it takes. You need to do this in community uh, to become the man that you're meant to be. And we're just praying for you. We're pulling for you. We hope that you're encouraged today, but that's it for today. Look forward to some more fight club stories. Again, Edgar, thanks for jumping on today for the rest of you guys. Have a great day and go get in the fight. Hey guys, thanks so much for being here today and listening to the show. Please be sure to head over to the website at get in the fight.club. And before you go, if you haven't already, please subscribe, click the like button and leave us a positive five-star review. It makes a huge difference whenever you do. Have a great day. Go get in the fight.